Hey, it's Dr. Jamal. Welcome to Teaching Rounds. And uh, we're going to talk about the pearls in clinical medicine. I've come up with these uh, five uh, general pearls that I wish that when I was a third or fourth year medical student, um, somebody had sat me down and said that these were um, some um, important principles um, that I needed to uh, remember. Over the years, I've, um, I've been reminded of these, and um, I wanted to share them with you. Um, let's um, talk about the first. Um, it's about being a lifelong learner. It's important to uh, uh, to keep reading, and uh, here in your third and fourth year, when you're being introduced to clinical medicine, um, it's important to read around the cases. It develops some re relevance to the the problem that you're um, that you're reading around. Um, it's also important to develop a passion for the knowledge base. Uh, it's important to remain as uh, uh, curious as a student, but be critical of the information, uh, both when it's verbal and when it's written. In evidence-based medicine. Um, some of the some of the principles there is to use um, uh, to, to look at the question and see whether that question is relevant and then to ask whether the results are valid whether the results are important whether the results are applicable um, the third aspect about re remaining a lifelong learner is that you really just have to study the work needs to be done it needs to be committed to uh, to a working memory there's a couple of different um, apps and uh, ways of, uh, of doing that one is one is something called Anki where you develop flashcards and they um, will remind you uh, with in a space repetition type um, method uh, about some some of the things you want to um, constantly keep in your working memory the other is to use mind mapping um, the second principle is um, is one that came from a lecture that Osler gave um, to the students at University of Pennsylvania um, at the turn of the century. He called it the master word of medicine. And what he means here is really what the secret is, what he sees uh, as as really the, the secret of, of medicine. Though a little one, the master word looms large in meaning. It's the open sesame to every portal, the great equalizer in the world, the true philosopher's stone, which transmutes all the base metal of humanity into gold. The stupid person among you it'll make bright, the bright person brilliant, the brilliant student steady. With the magic word in your heart all things are possible and without it all study is vanity and vexation. The miracles of life are with it, the blind see by touch, the deaf hear with eyes, the dumb speak with fingers. To the youth it brings hope, to the middle aged confidence and to the aged repose. It is directly responsible for all advances in medicine during the past 25 centuries. Laying upon, laying hold upon it, um, Hippocrates made observation and science the warp and woof of art. Galen so read its meaning that 15th century stopped thinking and slept up until the awakened by de fabrica of Vesalius, which is the very incarnation of the master word. With its inspiration, Harvey gave an impulse to a larger circulation, an impulse which we feel today. Hunter sounded all its heights and depths and stands out in our history as one of the exemplars of its virtues. With, its, with it, Verkau smote the rock and waters of progress gushed out while in the hands of Pasteur it proved the very talisman to open us to a new heaven in medicine and a new earth in surgery. Not only has it been the touchstone of progress, but it is the measure of success in everyday life. Not a man before you, but is beholden to it for his position here. While he who addresses you has the honor directly in consequence of having had it graven on his heart when he was as you are today. And the master word is work. A little one, as I've said, but fraught with momentous sequences, if you can but write it on the tables of your heart and bind it upon your forehead. What Osler is really trying to do is that he's um, he's not talking about work in the sense of just humdrum work. What he's really trying to do is for you to um, stay busy, but to uh, and to do as much as you can and to see as much as you can and to be industrious. This ties into the top of Miller's Pyramid. If you look at Miller's Pyramid, um, Miller's Pyramid starts off at the base where uh, you have knows and then knows how and then shows how and then does. And as somebody goes up Miller's Pyramid from the knows to the sh to the does, they develop expertise. So you go from being a novice to being an expert. And at the top is what Ozer was talking about. He's, he really said just you have to do the work, and that's how you're going to get good at, at this job. And really, it's the secret of getting good job, get, getting good at anything. The third principle is about the forest and the trees. Um, 
Uh, medicine is not, you know, conceptually hard. It, what's difficult, I'd say, is that there's so much um, that is, um, that's the forest. Um, and, and there's so much that's the trees, and it's hard to keep it separate from the forest. And you don't really know what to forget. You you end up, um, you know, remembering things and studying for your exam. And then when you, when you, um, when you just go on to another subject, you jettison that information, but there's things that, that are important to remember, and, and that is the forest, and to forget the trees. So you have to learn things mechanistically, you have to learn things from first principles. Um, the fourth is titled The Principles of Medicine, and I got this from a preface of an internal medicine textbook. And here, really, what what was um, you know what struck me was how simple the principles have and always have been. So the four principles are history taking, physical examination, communication, and caring, and all that um, is the very basis of it. The last, the, the rest, diagnostics, therapeutics, all the technology, all that's fluff. Let's talk about history taking. Um, History taking um, uh, is is still the cornerstone of figuring out what's wrong with the patient and really connecting to the patient. Um, to what what I do, there's a series of questions that I've just constantly use and have helped me over the years. The first question is, when were you last well? Just ask it exactly that way, and then after that ask what happened next. Here, the important thing is to live their symptoms. You have to live their symptoms. And um, when, say, somebody says that they are having, you know, abdominal pain and they can't sleep the night before you see them, you have to ask them, well, why couldn't they sleep? Could, could they not sleep because of, you know, because of abdominal pain or couldn't they not sleep because, you know, something else was bothering them? So that's an important thing. And then and then ask them, what happened today? A lot of their symptoms are going to been go have been going on for several days. What happened today? today. And then when they're right in front of you, you can ask, what are you feeling right this minute as you're laying here? And you'll be surprised sometimes because none of some of what they've said will, will be in the previous history. They'll say, oh, what's bothering me right now is a headache. And you know, they may not have mentioned that before. Lastly, a couple of other things I always ask if I'm uh, in, if it seems a little bit um, complex and um, difficult to sort out is what did they think is wrong? And lastly, of all their symptoms, of um, um, that that are troubling them. What's what's bothering them the most? The second principle here is physical examination. The modern day relevance of the physical exam is constantly being challenged. Uh, you know, uh, you've got you've got people that have forgotten how to examine the patient. That we don't examine people's neck veins. We don't listen to their heart sounds. We don't listen to their lung sounds. We've stopped looking and examining and using our eyes. And um, it's important not to throw away the baby with the bathwater here and to realize that um, that uh, the physical exam is still a cornerstone. Again, another principle that is particularly important in the emergency room with the relation to both the history and the physical examination is that the history and physical comes in bits and pieces in the ER. It doesn't come in a complete uh, a complete section. So keep keep aware of it. For example, if a patient comes in and let's say they were a little lethargic and you know you thought, well, maybe it was just related to alcohol and they'd been drinking and then their mother comes in and says, oh, this is like, you know, after the ambulance had, had already dropped the patient off and the mother says, oh, look, I found this bottle of, um, you know, uh, an empty bottle of some medications the patient has. So that, that you need to be constantly aware that that's going to happen. Uh, and also on physical examination as well, that things will become um, relevant. When you walk out of the emergency room, when you walk out of the initial evaluation of the patient, that's not the end of the history and physical. That's the beginning. So what you're trying to sort out from the very beginning is just how sick is the patient? Do you have to just stop doing everything and start saving their life? Are they an extremist? Number one. The second thing you want to know is, you know, are they going to be admitted or not? And where are they going to be admitted? And the third thing is what other tests are you going to order? Those preliminary things is what you're trying to get out with your first initial evaluation. And then stay open to the idea that both the history and physical will change and um, very relevant. The third principle is to communicate. This um, this job really is about trust, and and people are going to make a judgment about how. 
they, how much they trust you, depending on how you communicate with them and the words you pick. It's very important to pick the specific words. For example, if you call a neurosurgeon and you've got a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage and say, oh, I have this patient and they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, well, you're opening yourself up to lots of questions and lots of doubt. Imagine that same scenario if you were to call a neurosurgeon and say, I've got a patient who's uh, got a spontaneous grade three subarachnoid hemorrhage. Wow, that just changes everything. All of a sudden, you know, the, the understanding on the other side of the phone from the consultant is that, is that okay, this person, you know, has, um, has a deeper understanding of what the problem is and I can start trusting them. So communication is important and the words you pick is vital. Um, the last thing is caring here. And, you know, I, I don't want to just say, oh, yeah, it's, you know, everybody just kind of throws it in there. It's becoming part of, uh, of what, you know, and first and second year curriculum talking about caring and empathy. But really, this is so, so important. And you'll see down in the emergency room where people have stopped caring. And you have to keep from doing that. You And how how that happens and how you keep caring about your patient and you don't fall in the same trap that you see lots of other cl clinicians um, fall in is you have to first call it out. You have to really, you have to be aware of it. Be aware of it in others. Be aware in yourself and call it out. Not not overtly, but just in your mind, say, I'm not going to be part of this. If people, you know, uh, feel this way about this patient, I'm not going to feel this way. Uh, another way how you remain where you care is you have to relate to the patient. And what I do, a very simple way, is I ask what they do for a living. And when they tell me what they do, I, I you know, I'm, I'm exposed to what people do out in in um, in society, and so I could I could get a sense of who that person is. Um, and for example, I had a patient who had who came in and they were vomiting and they had gauges in their ears and they had tattoos in their arms and um and um you know it was hard for me to really uh, relate to this patient in many ways they were they were they'd vomit on their shirt they were vomiting in the in the trash can in the in the room and then i asked them i said what do you do for a living and they said that they were a barista and i said where and they said at starbucks and i thought wow that's like my barista you know this could be somebody who I saw today. Uh, so ask people what they do and, and try to relate to them some way. Uh, the last thing about caring is, is really you have to take care of yourself. You have to, you have to um, think about your wellness and do the things that are important to do, for you to do. A lot of times people stop caring because they, they're working so hard, they're, they've got 12 hours that they're on. We, we, I think it's important to keep your shift short, six, eight, ten. Six is a little unrealistic, but for sure eight hours should be about how much people ought to work. Even 10 is getting getting um, up there. And, and, and make time for the things that matter to you. Make sure you sleep enough, you exercise enough, you're eating right, you're spending time doing the things that matter to you. The, the fifth principle here, or the pearl, is really about clinical decision making and the avoidance of errors. Um, there, are, there are two aphorisms that I've remembered over the years and, and, and they relate to this one issue. One is if your only tool is a hammer, you'll see everything as a nail. Think deeply think deeply about your biases. This is what this is, is that when people have only a hammer as their tool, they're gonna to be biased at what they're looking at as a nail. So you have to really think slice and have a really thick slice rather, um, and, um, and have a really um, full feeling of what the, the biases are involved in yourself that could affect your judgment about this patient or this scenario. There are two very common biases or anchoring biases, which is what you know this, uh, this aphorism is about, that the person anchors that this is a nail because their only tool is a hammer and a confirmation bias. There's 99 biases, so really think deeply about what bias could be at play. And then the second aphorism is, is one that um, is, um, I'm reminded of over and over again, and that's you see what you look for and you recognize what you know. Medicine isn't pattern recognition. You don't just sort of look at something and say, oh yeah, you know, I've seen it before, they've got uh, a pneumonia. What it is, is it's you have to have an approach for everything and you really have to have a binary checklist. When you look at an EKG, you don't look at the EKG and it just comes to you that they have an, an acute MI. You really have to have an approach to that. Even with something as simple with pharyngitis, for example. When I look at somebody with pharyngitis, the first thing I say, hmm, you know what? The nurse says that the patient has pharyngitis. Wow, okay, well, you know what? That may just be me anchoring. Are we certain that's what we're dealing with? Maybe they've got something else. 
Uh, I can't, you know, I, I've seen cases where somebody has come in with pharyngitis and it turns out that they've got a retropharyngeal abscess or a peritonsillar abscess or they've got um, uh, epiglottitis. So, so, so be careful about when people say um, that somebody has, you know, something and then you, you think that that's what it is. But um, but what, you know you have to have a checklist for for almost everything. So have the, have this binary checklist, and then the last last um, important pearl is the use of heuristics and using the correct heuristics. And this is this is something I call, or I, I'm sorry that um, uh, that's been called thin slicing. And um, and you have to know when to thick slice and when to thin slice. And um, I think this gives you a a good. Um, overview of some of the pearls in clinical medicine and um, again um, I thank you and remember you see what you look for and you recognize what you know.